Welcome everyone and happy hunt, hump day and day three of Science Festival. Hopefully you had a little bit of a, a groove to that music. My name is Katrina Nguyen Robertson and National Science Week is absolutely my favorite time of the year. And I'm very excited today to explore Exciton Science. I've said it that way for a reason. <laughs> Dr. Chris Hall is going to illuminate the science of light. And yes, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of light puns in here today. So this is the third of five masterclasses running every day this week as part of Science Festival. We're showcasing brilliant University of Melbourne scientists and their groundbreaking discoveries. Just so that you are aware, because we're covering such great work and we don't want anyone to miss out, we are recording today's session. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm streaming from, and I'm working on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I invite you to pop into the chat which lands you're on. You, you might know the traditional owners of your lands, but we also just want to know where you are, so do please pop into the chat where you're coming to us from. I think it's important that we acknowledge First Nations people as the first scientists of this land. So for tens of thousands of years, they've been studying the land, the sky and the sea, and they've been passing down all of that knowledge that they gained from that from generation to generation. And I think we can also learn a lot about how we can care for country from the knowledge of First Nations people, especially thinking about how we can use resources sustainably so that country can continue to thrive and provide for us. And this leads really nicely into today's topic of sustainable energy. So could you imagine a future where all of the light hitting our buildings, our clothes, our cars is all transformed into renewable energy? A future where light is powering our world. Sounds like a pretty bright future is ahead of us thanks to the work of people like Dr. Chris Hall. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Hall, an ARC Future Fellow in the School of Chemistry as a physicist and physical chemist researching new materials. He's part of the ARC Centre of Excellence in Exiton Science, where the team is focused on researching innovative energy solutions for Australia and the whole world. And I want to introduce Chris with a little bit of a song and pop in the chat if you can figure out what song it is. May have changed the words a little bit. I said, ooh, I'm blinded by the lights. Oh, I get lots of energy from your touch. I said, ooh, the sun is shining bright, or oh, you're a green energy source that I trust. All right, that's enough from me. Let's get this glow on the road. I want to pass over to Chris. Take it away. All right, thank you, Kat. Um, well, um, as Kat said, my name is Chris Hall. I'm from the School of Chemistry here at the University of Melbourne. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us to, to learn a little bit about um, excitons and what we can do with them. Um, so we'd also like to point out, so yes, I'm at the School of Chemistry, but I'm also from Centre of Excellence for Exciton Science, which is um, a very large research centre spread out across Australia, interested in the applications of excitons, would you believe? So these are, so when we talk about excitons, we're talking about um, the, the development of materials that absorb light or uh, emit light and everything that we can do with those types of materials. Um, and we'll speak a little bit about that today and hopefully you'll pick up a few things. So here we are at the School of Chemistry. This is where I work. Um, this fantastic grand old building here at the University of Melbourne at the Parkville campus. It's a real privilege to, to be working at such a, such a place. And this is what our, what our lab looks. Here we looks like. So here we've got some equipment, very different to what you would probably expect for a, the, um, for a chemistry department. Uh, we're not looking at <laughs> wet labs here. Uh, I'm actually part of a division of chemistry called physical chemistry. And what this means is that we're instead of making molecules, we're instead interested in, um, we're instead interested in, uh, understanding how chemical reactions work and um, and then feeding that information back to the synthetic chemists in order to develop uh, 
better uh, materials for, for particular applications. And we'll take a look at some of the lasers we're using as well. So here we are, this is our research centre, as I said, spread out across Australia. We're talking about five universities across Australia here. Um, and this the centre brings together people from chemistry, physics, uh, mathematics, uh, engineering, all looking at the development of materials um, where excitons are important, but materials that we can use for a wide range of applications and hopefully um, uh, change the future. So we're talking about devices that use energy more efficiently, um, devices that generate light more efficiently, and a wide range of other things that you probably haven't heard of. So um, take a brief look at that as well. Okay, so before we really get stuck into it, I wanted to run this interactive quiz, and I'm hoping it works. Um, so if you go to this website, menti.com, and enter this code, um, you can have a go at answering this question. So the question is, what, do you, what is an exciton? What do you think an exciton is? Doesn't matter if we're wrong. <laughs> there's, there's lots of, uh, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's four answers to select from. Um, the answers are, um, is an exciton a quantum of energy? So the code, hopefully you can see the code, it's at the top, it's 33607876. I saw someone ask that question. Okay, so the, um, Oh no, the answers, the answers aren't there. <laughs> oh, we have people guessing and we have answers coming up. Fantastic, okay. So what do you think an exciton is? We've got an excited electron, a device for harvesting sunlight. There were two other options. Is it a quantum of energy? Uh, the other option is um, a, a bound electron and electron hole pair. There we go. So we've got answers in all quadrants now. Uh, quite a lot of people get excited electrons. All right, let's give it a few more seconds. Oh, seeing uh, lots of answers pop up. Okay, let's let's move on. So the answer here, an exciton, is actually it's a bound electron and electron hole pair. And I'll explain a little bit about what we mean by that. But yeah, thank you for for, for having a go at that. So what is an exciton? So let's first consider a molecule. This is a single molecule I've got drawn here. This is tetracine. So it's tetracine, tetra is the prefix because there are four carbon rings here. Um, and this is a molecule that we use fairly regularly in our work, um, but it's just representative here. So here we have our single molecule. And the feature of lots of molecules um, well, a feature of molecules and atoms is that the electrons in these systems uh, can only occupy well-defined energy levels. So here we have a series of energy levels with electrons in them. Uh, and we also have some, electron, some energy levels here without electrons. Um, so what happens if um, a molecule absorbs a photon of light and the energy of that photon matches the energy gap between some of these allowed energy levels in our system. So in this case, uh, our molecule has absorbed a photon. The energy of that matches this energy gap and our electron has been promoted from this level to this level. Um, well, here we've got a vacancy, a place where there used to be an electron. And here we have a state with now an electron. Out. So now our molecule has an excited electron and over here, a vacancy. And this is this is what we need, and this is what we call an exciton. We have a molecule with a vacancy and an excited state. All right. So now that we know what an exciton is, let's uh, take a bit of a look at some excitonic material. So here we have, imagine we're looking at a material at the molecular level. We've got a film of molecules, um, and the, a photon has hit our film. And uh, uh, one of these, these molecules has absorbed that photon. And we've generated an exciton on one of these molecules. So what can we do with this? Well, as an example, in this film, it's been designed in such a way that this exciton is in fact split into two. So now we've got an electron over here and a vacancy over here, and they find their way to an electrode. What do you think this, this type of device might be? Well, 
this is what we call a solar energy harvesting device or a solar cell. But this one is based on excitons. So we start with an exciton and we end up with uh, free charge carriers. So what we need to generate an electrical current. Okay, let's take a look at another system where excitons might be interesting. So again, we have our film of molecules. And one of those molecules is absorbed photon. But instead, this film is slightly different. This film has been engineered in such a way that our molecules are much closer together. And those molecules, in fact, uh, slightly feel each other. And in this situation, we end up with um, a situation where our absorbed photon energy is instead spread out over multiple molecules in our film. And then in this film, we end up with multiple excitons. So here we've got two excitons generated from a single photon. And then if we can split both of those excitons and generate electrons, two electrons and two vacancies and send them to our contacts, we end up with, well, we end up with another solar cell, but this is a special solar cell. This is a type of solar cell uh, utilizing a process that people in the field call singlet fission. Now, I'm not going to go into that in much detail, but hopefully you can start to sort of think about some of the advantages of this. You have a solar cell that generates multiple electrons and electrons, sorry, electrons and vacancies from a single absorption event. So potentially, if fully utilized, you can end up with a device that generates a lot more energy uh, than we currently do. Okay, one last example here. Here we have another molecular film, uh, but instead we're not, this film doesn't just have tetracines, we have some new molecules added. Here we have, this is a five carbon ring molecule, and we call this pentacene, um, and we've mixed this into our film. So again, uh, we have a photon come in, is absorbed by one of those molecules, but now we've introduced this new molecule and it's set up the film is set up in such a way that the exciton migrates to this new molecule we've added to the film. So what happens now? Well, um, this can be designed in such a way that that light, that, that, photo, that exciton recombines and we now get another photon emitted coming out of our film. So we call this an energy shifting film, but in this case, we've got one color of light coming into our film, but being re-emitted at a different color, um, coming, being emitted from our film. So one of the nice things about this type of system is that if you can, by replacing the type of molecule you have in your film with other types of molecules, you can actually change the color of light that comes out of this film. And hopefully, again, you can see, see where this is going. So this type of uh, system could end up, uh, if it's used in, for example, a, um, I don't know, like a light, emit, light emitting device, for example, you end up with uh, the potential to tune the energy of light or the color of light coming out of that material. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a brief, given you a bit of an idea of what an exciton is and some of the situations where we can, can use that. So how do you go about studying exitons? What's What are the techniques available? Well, as I said at the start, we use lots of lasers in our lab, and that's because we're an ultra-fast spectroscopy lab. We use pulses of light to study um, the dynamics, the things that happen over time in these types of, types of reactions. So before we really dig into some of those details, just um, for a moment, think about the fastest event that you as a human can conceptualize, can, not conceptualize, but to, can perceive. So say for example, uh, you are driving down the highway and a, a car coming, to, coming towards your direction pops over the crest and they've got their high beams on. How long does it take for you to, to recognize that, that you've now got a bright light in, pointing in your face and you want to pull the visor down? Well, the reaction time in these types of, it, to these types of, um, re excuse me, the reaction time to these types of events for, the, for humans is about a quarter of a second. And so that only puts us, if you think about the time scales on which different events occur, that really only puts us about here. When we start thinking about chemical processes and excitons, 
In fact, we need to really dig down into the, um, the scales of time. So the processes that we look at in these types of measurements uh, is in fact, it's quite a bit faster than milliseconds. It's faster than microseconds. Nanoseconds, when you keep going, picoseconds, we're actually, this is where we need to be in sort of this picosecond to femtosecond regime. So when we're talking about time on these scales, we're talking about um, a, a number with 15 decimal places. These are extremely fast um, processes and you need very specialized equipment. So look at that. So, so this is the time regime we need to look at when we're looking at excitons. Um, how do we study those? Well, let's think about how a camera works. How do you time resolve an event with a camera? Well, um, the, a camera has a shutter that opens and closes, and it's that time that the shutter opens and closes, opens and closes that determines the speed at which, well, sorry, the speed at which you can record that event taking place. Now with lasers, when you get down to these time scales, well, you can't use shutters anymore. They just don't operate fast enough. So to get down to this point in time, we need to use very short pulses of light. It's the only way you can probe these time scales. Um, and we have some very specialized equipment that does that. So let's take a quick look at one of these types of measurements. Here we have a laser this white box over here, we have a beam coming out of our laser. Um, and then we have, you see this beam going up here uh, to, to a sample. So why is this flashing? Well, this is a pulse laser. And this laser, we get 10 pulses per second. So you can see these pulses lining up the lab on this, type of, on this time frame. And at the same time, you can see your sample flashing. And that's from the mission coming out of our sample. And by measuring the light that comes off the, these types of samples, uh, between each of these flashes, we can start to interrogate some of these processes. Here's another example of some of the types of things we do. Here we have actually um, a photo detector. And if you scan, we were scanning a laser across this photo detector to try and learn a bit about, okay, how far do charge carriers migrate? Um, and by scanning this, this laser across this film and measuring the amount of charge uh, extracted from that film, we can start to probe some of these Exciton, uh, exitonic processes and exitonic um, uh, splitting processes in these, in these uh, systems. And this is another example. Here we have, um, this is probably, this is generally what you would see in some of our other labs uh, if you turn the lights off. Lots of laser beams and lots of bright colors. It's really quite a, a visually impressive lab to work in. Um, and certainly lots of fun. Okay, so. We've looked at excitons and we have a little bit of an idea of now how we study them. So let's take a look at now some of the, the wider applications of these materials. So exciton science, looking at everything to do with excitons, um, but really focusing on a number of different areas of research. Um, here we have um, our, uh, sorry, here we have there's something going on there. Um, so uh, a couple of different areas, solar energy, a major area of research uh, for us. Can we generate or develop devices uh, that generate electricity from sunlight, but in new and different ways to silicon? Uh, in the middle here, we have um, uh, exotonic devices. We're interested in controlling the function of exotons. And this really leads to potential new applications in uh, transistors and memory devices. And last of all, over here, just let me jump over this slide. Uh, some other in interesting areas for applications of exitons. Uh, new and interesting light emitting devices that are more efficient, current, um, current things that we have, and even applications in security. So can we use these types of materials to provide additional security um, to uh, currency, for example? Now, this is a very large area. I'm not going to talk about all of these things. Instead, today I'm just going to speak about uh, solar energy. Okay, so as scientists, we like to ask ourselves the question why? Why are we doing this? <laughs> why are we interested in this? Well, in the case of solar energy, I think it's pretty straightforward. Australia has really quite a lot of solar resources. Um, so we have a lot of sunlight, and that sunlight is free. And if we can utilize that for a wide range of applications, so 
powering our electricity, uh, electricity grid, for example. Um, well, you can see there's going to be a lot of advantages there. We can reduce the amount of CO2 we're generating. Um, but also, it's one of the cheapest forms of electricity. So if you can power your grid of a very cheap form of electricity, um, there's going to be enormous advantages for industry and the domestic population. One other question to ask is, OK, we have silicon. <laughs> Why are we looking at other materials? Well, silicon is fantastic. It's, it can be quite efficient. And it works very well as a rooftop energy generation source. But um, there are still limitations. Silicon is quite brittle. You can't bend the silicon solar panel. Um, you can't wrap it around a curved surface. It's going to be, there are limitations there in how we can use it. Um, it does generate, to make a solar panel is not an energy free process. If, if we're using coal fired power plants to make silicon panels, well, there's going to be a cost to that. And that cost is about two years. Um, of CO2 generation equivalent before we can then repay back that electricity uh, into the, the grid. So if we can avoid some of this, this that's going to be a major benefit. And lastly, finite resources. If everyone goes to silicon solar, um, we're going to start running out of uh, some of the mater materials we need. Uh, so we can use less materials. Um, clearly, there's going to be major advantages there. So let's consider. Um, a hypothetical, how much material would be required to power Australia 100% with solar electricity? So when I say material, I'm talking about how much of a light absorbing material would you need to do this? Now, if we take a look at exotonic materials, um, we can see that um, if we were to measure the amount of material we needed in swimming pools, this is an Olympic sized swimming pool, then the, the amount of, so sorry, the key point here is that exotonic materials are very strong absorbers of light and you don't need much of them. So we're only talking about two Olympic sized swimming pools to power uh, Australia. But if we compare that against silicon, silicon you need a lot more of that material in order to make a functional solar cell. And that's because the layer of silicon that you need is really quite thick. So by comparison, we need to start looking at a lot more silicon. So we, by equivalence, we're looking at 400 Olympic sized swimming pools filled uh, with uh, refined silicon. So and when we start talking about refined silicon, we're talking about lots of energy required to make this material and a really high quality material. Um, so this, this there really is a major difference here. So let's take a look at some of the things that we can use exotonic materials for um, in the solar world. So some of our collaborators um, here at Melbourne and at Monash, uh, working with CSIRO, looking at some, some printing technology. So you take your solution-based exotonic material and print it onto plastic very much like um, very much like a newspaper. And you can imagine a large factory printing out rolls and rolls and rolls of a newspaper-like material. Well, you can do this very quickly and easily uh, and fairly cheaply on lightweight materials. There's um, really lots of advantages here. And here we have an example of such a flexible solar cell. So this is a, an exotonic material, we call this perovskite, printed onto a piece of plastic. Um, and as you can see, it's very flexible and lightweight. And you can do that on lots of different scales. So here we have a much larger piece of this material. Um, and we can generate electricity from that. So exotomic materials in solar cells, in flexible solar cells, are really um, have lots of different applications. So proposals include solar powered tents. You go camping for multiple days in a row, now generate electricity. Uh, if you've been to the Melbourne Zoo, here we have uh, a demonstration of a flexible solar cell, um, solar shade. Um, again, flexible cells, you, you fold them nicely around curves, potentially used uh, in future solar powered cars. And there are some other, some other interesting applications in terms of uh, emergency response and needing to generate electricity remotely. 
um, and, and fairly easily. And being able to bring in very easily a lightweight material that could do something like that. So one other application of excitons is some work that I want to speak about that's happening here at Melbourne. These are devices that are called uh, luminescent solar concentrators. And these effectively consist of either a piece of glass onto which we have printed an excitonic material. So this is a material that absorbs light. Another way of doing this is instead of having a piece of glass, just having a piece of plastic, that excitonic material mixed into that. So effectively have a colored piece of plastic. So the, the neat feature of these types of excitonic materials is that um, light comes in, light's absorbed by some of these molecules and then re-emitted at a different color. And that re-emitted light is actually trapped, becomes trapped within the film. So for example, if it's, re if it's emitted here, you might get multiple reflections of that light across the film and that light will eventually find its way to the end of the film. So effectively, this is how you concentrate so by concentrating solar, what we're talking about is we've got this wide sort of area of sunlight hitting our device, but then being transformed uh, to propagate into our film along that film to the end of our device. So we take our film and then attach a silicon solar cell or some other solar cell to the end of that device to then collect that light. So instead of having a large area solar cell, you now have a small area solar cell collecting concentrated sunlight. Um, so, what do they look like? Well, the, the, these things are real and they do work. Here we have some work by a PhD student here at Melbourne where they made a, one of these large area uh, luminescent solar concentrator films. And you can see we've got light coming in here. And then now we've got light being uh, trapped in the film and coming out of the end of our film along this edge here, this, this bright strip across here. So what do they look like? Well, I've got a nice little demonstration of that here. Just let me change my camera. Here we go. So here we have uh, a large area, fully functioning, luminescent solar concentrated device. This is our light absorbing material. And around the edge here, within the frame of this device, we have solar uh, energy converters. So uh, silicon solar cells, for example. And this really does work. You can take this outside, put it in the sun, and you can charge your phone from this. So it's a, it's a fully functioning device. Um, so to give you another example of what they look like, here we have, turn the light off, our LSC material. Now, uh, this one has been designed to absorb ultraviolet light. So light at the very blue end of the, the light spectrum. If we shine a light on that, you can now see um, that light being re-emitted uh, within the film, being trapped in the film and being directed towards the edge. Now to, to convince you that that really is emission and not just scatter, let's take a look at one other film. This one um, doesn't absorb ultraviolet light, instead it absorbs green light. Let's do the same thing. I've got my torch turned on and you don't have that same sort of bright emission right at the edges of the film. So this, this is really a, a real effect. So let's jump back into the presentation. There we are. And, sorry, excuse me, I just need to wiggle my mouse over here. All right, so the last area I want to speak about is some really interesting work that's happening, um, or being done by some of, our, some of our collaborators, again, out at One Ashway. And, what they're doing out there in collaboration with mathematicians and engineers is investigating the solar energy potential of the urban landscape. Uh, so here we have a city landscape. Hopefully some of you recognize the city. Um, this, is, this is South Bank, Melbourne South Bank. So here we have the art center, uh, the Eureka Tower over here. The Yarra River runs along, along here. And, and up here we have St Kilda Road. So they've modeled Melbourne South Bank uh, in really uh, extreme detail. And what they've modeled is the amount of sunlight that hits the buildings in the urban landscape um, over the course of a year. And what you find are these red areas, the tops of the buildings receive the most sunlight. But as we look down our color scale down here, so as we decrease in average solar exposure, we go from red to orange, to yellow to blue. 
we still see quite a bit of orange and yellow on the sides of the buildings here, normally where the windows sit. Um, and then you can take that a step further and calculate, okay, where on these buildings really would be feasible to extract uh, solar, extract sunlight and convert that into solar energy. Well, it turns out um, they've done some really interesting cal calculations and what they find out is that presently the city really only generates, well, it generates about 1% of the amount of energy that it uses. So most of the energy in the city is really being imported in from across the, across the state. But instead, if you were to, if you instead were to convert um, all of that instant light into electricity, factoring in the efficiency of solar windows and solar panels, um, what could, what is the energy generation potential? Well, it turns out you could reach 75% of the city's energy needs by using solar windows based on this type of LSE technology. Um, which is really quite an impressive uh, feat, I think. And some of these buildings even become entirely self-sufficient self in energy, such as these really large skyscrapers with lots of side solar exposure. So what would these windows look like? Well, they look something like this. Here we have, depending on the level of tint you would use, you would absorb different amounts of sunlight. But the really interesting thing here, I think, is that down this darker end of the spectrum, um, it turns out the this is really comparable to some of the commercial tents that buildings are using at the moment. And, and we can now, they're now making devices, exotonic devices, um, that are converting that sunlight at about 20% efficiency, almost 20% efficiency. These are really interesting, um, really interesting area of research and application of exotons uh, in the future. So it looks like I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna skip this last quiz and just jump straight to the end. So um, I think we might stop there, Katrina. Thanks so much, Chris. I'm going to give you a round of applause on behalf of everyone. <laughs> um, if you have any questions for Chris, just pop them in the chat and I'll relay them. Um, but just as we're waiting for questions, I actually have have a lot. So um, I might just start off with a question that is is relevant to anyone who's maybe thinking about buying into like buying solar cells right now, like if you haven't already got one for your house, um, you mentioned that, you know, currently we've got silicon ones out there, it's finite resource. Would you sort of say that your technology is going to be out there soon enough that maybe we should hold off and just wait until we can get, you know, this better solution? That's a interesting question. I think <laughs> there are, we are seeing some of the exotonic materials being converted into commercial devices at the moment. Um, and I believe they're already commercially available. Um, this is, you're talking about small companies, so we're talking about small numbers Com of companies, solar cells. Companies, people, yeah, like for, for your house and, and things like that. But, but uh, yeah, we are, we are seeing sort of some emergence of these materials in, in these devices. So in terms of, it, well, I, I wouldn't hold off buying them they're still going to be pretty useful but yeah. um but we are starting to see a transformation in the uh, in the area yeah well it'll be really exciting to see you know like our, all of our buildings like this with with um these flexible solar cells they'll be amazing yeah. um yeah someone asks a question about plants because you know obviously plants use solar energy themselves to to make sugar and things like that so would it be possible to modify plants to such an extent that you know they can be taking in the sunlight and we can use them to get electrical energy from the solar energy well actually this is an interesting question now, this is a actually closely related to a project that was involved in in the uk before coming out here and there are some interesting projects happening around this particularly around um, yeah, extracting um, electrical current from even bacteria, to be honest, uh, bacteria that convert chemical energy into electrical currents. And, and they've got functioning devices like uh, a bacteria powered calculator, for example, this type of thing. It's really quite interesting. Um, I'd say that stuff's a pretty early stage, but um, I wouldn't say, wouldn't rule out any of these possibilities yet. Yeah, it's super exciting. I read recently about like, you know, bacteria that do that using our sweat. 
like so can you oh, imagine like, wear, wearables where bacteria are converting you know our sweat into a into energy um i see uh Omka asks how long do these materials last on average um so one of the major challenges associated with okay why haven't we seen these materials out commercially available now is device stability and this is really one of the the great challenges with these materials so at the moment silicon they suggest at 20 to 30 years on your rooftop and that that's really sort of the um the ballpark that these materials need to be in uh, to be competitive um, and at the moment well it's pretty hard to test sort of that far ahead but um we're talking there are suggestions that the newer materials coming out are starting to be competitive with those materials so stability is an issue but that is one of the challenges and that's that hence why we're sort of investigating these these problems yeah we have scientists working on the answers <laughs> Um, I have a question about color shifting. So you, you, you mentioned how you can sort of take energy and then with, with one wavelength and, and one color and sort of change it into another one. Does does it work outside of the visible spectrum? So could you be creating like um, non-visible light? Absolutely. So I think one of the one of the challenges selling this LSC idea, the luminescent solar concentrator, is that no one really wants fluorescent yellow window. They want something that's clear. So if you could make a device that absorbs invisible light, so possibly at the blue end of the spectrum, um, and convert that into uh, electricity, then you start looking at materials that are probably a bit more commercially friendly, materials that people want to build into their buildings. Um, so that's that's really uh, where the area is going, actually, looking at that visible light, um, using the parts that we don't want to use to generate electricity. That's 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 really an interesting area, and uh, yeah, key to the to this technology, I think, really taking off. Mm, yeah, uh, Joshua asks, could exotonic materials be used on rovers and space stations? Great question. Um, so. Uh, on rovers, as in like, I, I presume like rovers? Mars rovers. And... Oh, right. <laughs> I, I don't see why not. Like wherever, you, as long as there's sunlight and there's energy to be to be converted into a form that's useful, why not? Yeah, well, I guess like um, the rovers currently on Mars are powered using solar, so you know why not? Why not this kind of solar? Exactly, exactly. It's just that it, they're already. Yeah, as you say, already using solar energy, so it just depends on how they how they go about converting that. Mm. Um, you you briefly mentioned that this sort of the exciton science could be used in security as well, and you didn't really go into it, but you had a picture of a banknote. Could you yeah. just explain like how how it could be used? Is it like in terms of looking for counterfeit money? Yeah, well, so when it comes to anti counterfeiting. The interest there really is, can you build things into banknotes that people can't do themselves outside of extremely specialist facilities? So if you can include a material into banknotes that um, that people don't really understand how it works and how you achieve a particular result, um, then then there's a lot of potential there in terms of adding security features to, to banknotes. So uh, some of the, the exotonic materials we're looking at uh, have a lot of applications in those types of systems. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's um, um, an interesting area. And um, yeah, certainly lots of potential. Yeah, it really does sound like it. Is there any potential that they could be used in uh, fields like medicine and health sciences? Um, Exotonic materials in general. Um, that or, or specifically, um, you know, the luminescent solar concentrator. Um, 
I don't know. <laughs> so you're pushing, pushing the boundaries of my, my um, uh, creativity again. Yeah. Well, just get some like, you know, biomedical sciences in, in the mix. Like, you know, if I don't know how many we might have on the call today, but, you know, start the conversation now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's plenty of applications. Like, okay, an application where a fluorescence material might be handy. Imagine if you had a, you wanted a more sensitive rat test for, for COVID, for example. So at the moment, you're looking for a color change on an additional light, on an additional line in your test. But if you could build in fluorescence, for example, into that type of measurement, you could, that potentially you could make something that's um, more sensitive um, than, than, than what you can do just by visually inspecting um, a test like that. Uh, and then that's sort of a, an interesting area as well. Like, yeah, lots of applications. Yeah. I mean, it sounds amazing, but unfortunately we've come to the end of the shine or the end of the line. Um, I did promise that there'd be lots of light puns and I didn't I didn't light, lie. This is getting really bad. I think it's time to stop, but please join me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, please joining me in thanking Dr. Chris Hall for an amazing presentation, for shining the light on the applications of exoton science in materials and especially how we can use free sunlight. I do see that there are, there's a question in there that hasn't been answered, but we will definitely pass on your question, your unanswered questions to, um, to Chris as well. That'll be great. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, um, as, as members of the audience, for your questions, for your participation in the polls and things like that. Um, and remember that you can come along to our other masterclasses. I see some repeat names in here, which is amazing. So tomorrow we have Dr. Kate, who will be talking about the science of bushfire risk. And on Friday, Professor Michael's talking about the grasshopper who don't need no man to reproduce. <laughs> Um, so you can register for both or, or any of those using the link that's been popped in the chat. Um, there's lots more on at Science Festival this week, so check out the schedule. And you can also read a lot more about Chris's work. And there are links to some exciting Exiton games in the chat as well. So definitely check out those resources. Thank you very much, Dr. Chris Hall, and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.